situation, you have to be a professional. You have to have standards and you have to have institutions. We all talk about a revolution. We all talk about destroying. But who talks about rebuilding? Jeez. If you are a pan-Africanist, then you are about nation building. Jeez. So in order for you to build that nation, you have to fill the roles that a nation has. You have to put people in the place where they will be best suited for. Jeez. So in this state of time, I am offering positions in my chapter for teachers, for doctors, for nurses, Jeez. for singers, Jeez. for dancers, Jeez. for people who can draw, for people who can dance. Because please believe, there is a child who wants to learn how to be a better boy, how to be a better black girl, but she can't read very well. Maybe you will be that sister or brother who has the time that will go and help them learn how to read. You do not have to change the world or move a mountain to be a Black Panther, but you do have to instill change. You do have to motivate change, no matter how that change will come. Don't be so caught up in trying to be the next Malcolm X and being the next Martin Luther King and being the next Chelsea Chisholm. Why don't you be the next whatever your name is? Jeez. Why don't you be the next whoever your name is? Jeez. That is what I'm offering here in the Atlanta chapter of New Black Panther Party. I am offering you a chance to redefine who you are, not as an African American, but an African enslaved in America and striving to be free. I am now the author of a published book, which is the first book of a three book series. It is my life story because I may look this way today, but just 10 years ago, I was sleeping across the street behind Auburn Library. I slept on the martyr trains. I stole, I prostituted, I tried to kill myself with drugs. All of this is part of the destruction of the African American family. And it starts with the youth. We always underestimate the youth, but the youth are the ones that are doing the most heinous crimes right now. And that is because the youth are born with the innocence. So when they grow, they will be groomed into whatever their social conditions will instill in them. It is our jobs as the higher generations, as the older ones, to set an example. So it does not matter what you used to do. As a Black Panther, as a new African, as a responsible, professional revolutionary, you are to be held accountable for what you know. So you can't come to a Black Panther meeting kicking all these black facts, but when you walk out the door, you act in white, talk in white. Teach. So in the Black Panther Party here, we are to be held accountable. And I am honored to be under the man, Dr. Malik Zouj-Shabazz, the attorney at war, because I know that I can hold that man accountable. I know that he will stand fast on what he teaches and what he has been taught. So it is my job. My role or responsibility to stand fast, not just to my ideology, but to my responsibility as a new African woman. I will never tell you one thing and you catch me around the corner doing another. Because that is the same process that has kept us going around, around the circle. Picket fences over here, protesting over there. But we still do the same thing over and over again. Revolution is about total constructive change. Revolution is total constructive change. It is not going around the circle practicing futility by doing the same tactics that do not work. So the Atlanta chapter of the New Black Panther Party is setting a prototype for what the new urban, new African revolutionary should be doing out of our generation. We don't expect you to fall in suit with the older generation of Panthers, but we do expect you to try your best to facilitate whatever <coughs> role you can do because you are from another generation. We speak different. We have a different swag. But you have to define that swag as in being African and not being European. A sister asked a question yesterday. She said, what can a black woman do to make the black man get his act together? Well, truthfully, we cannot do anything to make anyone get their act together. But I will tell you, sisters, this as a black woman, you must hold yourself and your vagina accountable. Stop laying down and doing whatever you want to do with a man, but you want him to be a king. So sisters, if you want our black men to stand up and work harder, why don't you hold him and yourself accountable? Don't ask for African standards, but you want a white man in the head, and you're still acting white. So that is my role as the black woman's representative. It's to tell you these things harshly and truthfully. 
Because the people that are working against us, the forces that are working against us, they don't lie. They don't whitewash what they do. They'll tell you very candidly that you are a nigger. So you must tell yourself very candidly that I am an African. I am a queen. I am a king. And this is the reason why I told my story in my series, Cold Soul. Because if you grow up with no identity, you will be cold. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to my honorable chairman, but I wanted to introduce myself to you because by you being students in this city, it is your role to assimilate into fascism. That is what the universities were first made for. It was not for higher learning because the higher learning institutions were in Africa. Institutions in America were made to assimilate you into a capitalist society. That is the reason why Dr. Shabazz said the role of the African American student is to use your tactics and your skills to build a black nation. So at this time, I want y'all to prepare yourselves to receive some jewels from a man who has been steadfast on the forefront of the African liberation struggle. Dr. Malik Zulu Shabazz is the longest chairman of any Black Panther formation. Any Black Panther formation. So at this time, I want y'all to give a strong black man to the attorney at war, the Honorable Dr. Malik Zulu Shabazz. Please give her a strong black hand. Give her another black hand. All right, giving honor to God, I bear witness that regardless to land, regardless to label, regardless to language, that there is but one God. So I, let me open up here and greet you all. Black power. Black, black power. power. Let's say it louder so they can hear us in the hall. Right on. You got to kind of rock and got to get these campuses together. Black power. Black, black power. power. Y'all sound strong now. Mm -hmm. Power to the people. Power, power to, to the people. people. Asalaamu As Alaikum. Alaikum As Asalaamu As sir. Hotel. 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 I'm from Africa and a tour that I'll talk about and give you some slides on in a moment. But in Africa, when we say E-Africa, the response in Azania or South Africa is Izweledu. Izweledu means the land belongs to us. So when I say E-Africa, you say Izweledu. E-Africa? Izweledu. E-Africa. Izweledu. And you sound good after 400 years. Mm -hmm. Robbed from your homeland. Um, it is my honor, again, giving honor to God. Again, I bear witness that regardless to land, label, or language, regardless to ritual, rite, or religion, regardless, I bear witness that there is but one God. And I come to give thanks to all of those who read the Bible. You know the prophets of Scripture. You know Abraham. I honor Abraham. We know Moses. I honor Moses. We know Jesus, or Yahshua, the black revolutionary Messiah. I come here to honor Jesus. And I come here to honor the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But I also come to say that we are the choice of God. I also come to say that God has come to us in the West and has spoken to us in the West. And so he has given us divine warners and divine prophets and divine helpers. I thank God for a bold black woman who was charging hard on the Underground Railroad and spoke about earlier by our queen. I'm talking about Sister Harriet Tubman. I give honor to Reverend Nat Turner. He's one of my favorite pastors because he sure know how to operate. I'm talking about Reverend Nat Turner. He's one of my favorite pastors, and he should be one of your favorite pastors. So Reverend Nat Turner. I give honor for the Honorable Marcus Mosiah Garvey. I give honor to the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Minister Malcolm X. I give honor to Dr. King. I give honor to Rosa Parks. Yes, I give honor to the original members of the Black Panther Party, and I give honor to everyone who has given their life for this cause and who have sacrificed for this cause and who have labored so that we may be here today and to an extent living a life of luxury compared to what they live. But sisters and brothers, if I live to be a thousand or the ripe old age of Methuselah, or I just don't quite make it past 969, 
I give thanks for a bold, bald-headed black man who is my teacher, and you know him well. His name is Minister and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. Now we're here. I'm honored. I'm happy in this in this little session here. They fired up here. Give yourselves a black hand. National Chief of Staff, right. Minister. Chief. Okay, let me teach. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Can't get enough of it. Right. This is a, uh, give me a minute, man. Right? He's just too strong. <laughs> Minister, we all in a good mood today, and it's good to be in a good mood. We done got some rest, and we're getting ready to get down here tonight and on this webcast. There are many who are watching. They are watching now from across the country, even from across the globe. I've come back from South Africa, Azania. There are students who are listening and watching, and there are people who want to know about this movement we are a part of and where we're going. So let's get down to it. I thank uh, Minister Hashim Nzinga, the National Chief of Staff, who have brought me here. And Hashim Nzinga have brought me here in a strategic way. You know, the administrators and the deans and those who run these universities are not exactly receptive to Malik Zulu Shabazz and the New Black Panther Party. Uh, there has been a lie campaign that has been started and initiated by the Anti-Defamation League, the Southern Poverty Law Center, other whites who are not in our best interest. And their job is to go online. Their job is to go on the internet and to distort and to defame and to slander me and us to keep you from hearing us. So the fact that he has maneuvered, Minister Hashim Nzinga, has maneuvered to get us in here behind enemy lines so you can hear me for yourself and that we can have this webcast from Georgia State University is very important. That means that we'll be back in the fall stronger and we'll be back at Clark stronger and Morehouse stronger. We are going to reach our black college students. Our black college students are our best and they are our brightest. They are a key part of the future of our nation. I come from Howard University undergrad. I come from Howard University School of Law. I know all about the student movement, student activism, the inside and the intricacies of being a student on campus is very important. So listen in, not only to you here, but the other students who are watching. To our Atlanta chairwoman, who spoke beautifully and brilliantly and with such clarity, let's give her a strong hand, Sister Nadia Asada Shakur. Nadia Asada Shakur. Let us all, and those who are watching, let us get her book. It is on Amazon.com. It's right here in my black hand. It's called Cold Soul. Cold Soul, as she dictates and uh, describes her journey to where she is now and what she's been to, her trials and tribulations and to now be an African woman, an African queen of high consciousness, high caliber. I really, really respect and honor her. She is my companion in this mission. She is my ally in this mission, and she is uh, the Atlanta chairwoman of the New Black Panther Party, and as a woman and a warrior, a part of our defense network. But she has a brilliant mind, and she will be teaching. You'll be able to hear her every other week on Black Power Radio, uh, our Black Power Radio, which can be found on our website, newblackpanther.org, where we are every Monday night and every Wednesday night. But again, Cold Soul, pick up the book, Cold Soul. It's Amazon.com, and all you have to do is look for a search, Cold Soul yeah. by Nadia Asada Shakur. Please, and get in tune with this modern African female free fighter. It is again my honor to be here uh, with others. You here at Georgia State University and to the also the lecturer here and the progressive black woman sister, Imina, who is also in the Atlanta area and from Clark, she has in the audience as well. Let's give her a strong black hand. We're gonna cook in this session. We were at Clark University yesterday in another student session, and we come out with good results. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to, and we have from Clark University, students we met. Sister Andres, who is here and has provided me good, well-written research. She writes like she's writing on a computer. 
like she got a computer in her hand, so she is giving me some good research and facts. We fired up and inspired many of the students yesterday at Clark, and they have been texting my phone, and some are here today, and they want to go further into what we're building. What are we building? We're building a black conscious student movement, a black conscious student movement in the new Black Panther Party that will reach inside the campuses and reach directly to the students because the students are very important. My subject here is the role and responsibility of the black college student. What is the role and the responsibility of the black college student? Are we just trying to get a degree here? Are we just trying to get a job here? Are we just trying to make some money here? Or is there a bigger plan? Is there a bigger purpose to our lives? We went over this yesterday, that many on these black college campuses at Georgia State, at Clark Atlanta University, at Morehouse or Morehouse or Spelman, that many of us are first or second generation college students. Many of us are the first or the second generation in our families to go to college and to have the chance to achieve those uh, bachelor degrees, bachelors of arts, bachelors of science, to go on to get those graduate degrees in whatever field in graduate studies or legal studies or medical studies. Many of us are pioneers in our families. Why are we pioneers, as we discussed yesterday? We are pioneers because our parents and grandparents and great-grandparents were discriminated against. While white children and white youth have always been encouraged and allowed to go to college, graduate, uh, and move on to higher professions, such as doctors, such as lawyers, such as uh, bankers, investors, own property, build institutions, build law firms, uh, hospitals, and all that exists in what's called America, white people and white youth and their children have had a major advantage. We were banned and prevented from going to universities. We were discriminated from achieving higher education, discriminated against from joining bar associations as lawyers, medical associations as doctors. We have been crippled by white racism. We have been crippled by discrimination. We have been crippled by racism in America. Now, we're not here to make excuses, but we are going to drop the facts. This is what's behind what's called the achievement gap, the gap between black and white, the income between black and white. It is not because you're inferior. It is not because you can't learn right. It is because you have been cheated out of your divine destiny by a cheating system, Tell and by that. a cheating people who have cheated us. We also have in the audience here uh, uh, Brother Rowe, who um, I'm scheduled to meet with in a few moments, who has obtained shocking and revealing information in the legal arena against white Jewish uh, entertainment firms who control our artists, who, who manage and control all of the big names, Oprah Winfrey and Michael Jackson and Beyonce and all of them. He has fighting tooth and nail in the illegal arena and has pulled a cover off of the so-called Jews who are exploiting our people in the music industry and has uncovered in the course of his litigation serious emails and information from behind enemy lines that show how they really feel about us and how they really talk about us as they represent us, take money from us, and exploit us. Now, how they call us niggas and coons and monkeys and baboons he has gotten the facts, and he's in a hell of a battle. Uh, so let's give him a black hand, because he said <laughs> he said he want attorney Malik Shabazz to look at his case and possibly help him as his attorney, because he wants somebody that's not afraid of the white man. And that's how I get my business a lot of times. Somebody I'm the lawyer. I am the lawyer that is not afraid of the white man, no, and I'm not afraid of the system. Now, who am I? Uh, just to reiterate, let me get to some facts. Let me give you a few biographical facts for those who are at Georgia State who need to understand. I am an attorney at law. I, um, again, graduated from Howard University undergrad, Howard University School of Law. I'm a former student activist and a student revolutionary on campus. I organized sessions like this and mass rallies and mass demonstrations during my entire tenure at Howard University. Uh, during an, area of, an era of heightened black consciousness and heightened black power. 
uh, at the end of the 1980s and the beginning of the 1990s. I'm talking about that time when Public Enemy was on fire, that time when x Clan was on fire, that time um, when many of the black conscious groups and, and artists, Queen Latifah, um, and others. Name some. Help me. Talk to me. KRS One. Ice Cube. Huh? Tribe Called Quest. Talk to me. Run DMC. Zulu Nation. I'm part of the Zulu Nation. We're talking about an era, what we call the golden era, defined giants, if you will. The golden era of rap and hip hop music when rappers were black conscious and talking to our people and were shaking up the system. At the time when um, the people were in the streets around Yousef Hawkins and other racial murders in New York and around the country. And so it's a different rap scene today. We'll get into it, but that's the era that I come out from in the black conscious student movement. There's Minister Hashim and Zinga again right here. Let's give him another black. <laughs> I was telling them earlier that this is an important move you're making. It's an important seminal step, beginning step, getting us behind enemy lines letting the students and the audience that are listening here, here, and by webcast to understand that we're not madmen, we're not crazy, we're not, as the Anti-Defamation League says, racist, anti-Semitic organization. No, we're black nationalists, we're pan-Africanists, and we have a legitimate gripe, a legitimate grievance against the United States government a legitimate gripe and a legitimate grievance against the way the white world and system has treated us. But not only are we here to present a grievance and a gripe, we're here to do something about it. Mm. And we're here to organize our people never again to be victims of white racism and white supremacy and to build a better world for ourselves. And we are full of belief, full of confidence, and full of examples as we'll get to on this PowerPoint presentation about how we will be successful. We have the faith here that we will be successful. Now, as an attorney at law graduating from Howard University, I went through controversy at Howard University. I organized so strong and with so many great leaders, Dr. Khalid Muhammad, Minister Louis Farrakhan, Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Kwame Ture, Dr. Yusef Ben Yakin. Uh, all of those came to my campus but sometimes they came to my campus under great controversy. Great controversy and opposition from Jewish groups, opposition from white groups. It was in the Washington Post, all in the news. Some of it still on C-SPAN today. Search the history of Unity Nation. And so as a student organizer, I was not, by God's grace, just an average student organizer. I was a student organizer that was at the top of the president's agenda at, at my university and the board of directors and the deans, at some point, they all wanted to know about this Malik Zulu Shabazz, and they wanted to shut Malik Zulu Shabazz down and to shut uh, my mouth and to shut my organizing down on the campus of Howard University. That's how I met Hashim Menzinga, April 19, 1994, for that infamous program right. at Howard University called the Black Holocaust. Go to YouTube. Put them two words in, Black Holocaust, Howard University, and Khalid Muhammad. 1,500 students and people from the community on the inside, 2,000 on the outside, right. clamoring to get in right. to our epic and classic program at Howard University. The last strong program at Howard University, the Black Holocaust. So they had came under the attack. I came under attack as a student. I was told I wouldn't graduate. I was told I would never pass the bar. I was told I would never be a lawyer. I was told that I would suffer for life for what I had done for our people and for the words that the speakers that I had brought that had offended the puppet masters of Howard University. I'm sorry to tell you, even though this is not a black college, our black colleges are not under our control. Our black colleges were set up in a certain way to produce a subservient student, a subservient institution that would serve the interests of white America, but would not really teach us how to go for ourselves, employ ourselves, build for ourselves, and take control of the vast black economy. So I stepped on the toes of the puppet masters of Howard University. And to be honest, I stepped on their toes in faith, in faith that our God is greater than the enemies of our people. And I was successful. 
I passed my bar on the first time. Right. But many of the other students were still trying, the law students were trying mm -hmm. to go back for their second time, third time, some of them fourth time, <laughs> fifth time, sixth time. I stepped right out on faith and on the first time passed two of them on my first time. Now I practice in Washington, D.C., Maryland. I practice in federal courts around the country, including the 11th Circuit here, <coughs> New York, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles. I practice in the area of constitutional rights, civil litigation. I deal with police brutality, police abuse, uh, police that are out of control all over America that are killing our babies, killing our youth, shooting first and asking questions later. Those are the kind of legal battles that I fight in the courtroom. These are the kind of clients that I represent, as well as other victims' rights and injuries and offenses that take place against our people. Those are the kind of cases that I fight. And I'm also, of course, a professional organizer. I am the chairman of the New Black Panther Party for Self-Defense, and I'm going to remain that as long as God tells me to do that. These brothers and sisters that are here with me, they travel here from around the country. Minister uh, Hakeem Muhammad, he's a legend. You don't even know this man. This man is a legend. Let's give him a black hand. And Brother Bilal and Kinte and others, they we believe in each other, and they believe in my leadership. They want my leadership. And guess what? I'm going to retain it and sustain it. Absolutely. It doesn't hurt my business. They call in my phone all day. They want a lawyer. People want a lawyer, an attorney that will stand up for them, that will fight for them, that will not tuck and tuck and duck and run at the first sign of opposition. And so in this discussion here, the role and responsibility of the black college student. My pitch here, my argument here, to you who are listening and those who are watching on this webcast, my pitch here will be that we should dedicate our time and our talent totally towards the liberation of our people. Yes, and if you are interested in, obviously, in paying your student loans back and achieving your careers, I'm gonna give you some facts and some statistics that will let you know that there's more than enough money, that there are millions and millions and billions of dollars right inside the black community, right inside what we call the black nation, more than enough to sustain you. And I will show you how white people are in our own communities taking dollars and out of our community like wagon loads, train loads of money out of our own community while we as black college students are running over there trying to get a job with the white man. And he may hire you for, he may hire you, and may not. And if he does, he may keep you on for a few years and then dump you. Hello. Yes, Many of law students and who have graduated with me and went on to pitch and to become part of white law firms under the illusion and the dream that they will become partners. And then they said after three years and four years and five years, it just didn't happen. And then uh, other white younger lawyers came in and they pushed them past them up to the top. Same way in other business ventures and corporate ventures under the illusion that they would accept you. And then you, under that illusion or delusion that you would be accepted and rise in white corporate America came disappointment, came tragedy. And after that even came depression and suicide by many who believed in from these college campuses that they would really be able to make it in white America. My argument today is that your future is not in white America. And your future is not in helping the white man build up his empire. You must build your own. That's right. I will show you some slides today to show you that you are not dependent on the white man for success, for your career success. You built civilization and empires before the white man was even a thought on the planet. You taught him everything he knows. And so don't come with me with this inferior mindset, this inferior talk about how much we need white people. I'm here to show you by example, current example, and historical example to show you that you indeed are the masters of your and our own destiny. Now let's look at a few facts. Thank you, Andres, for the quick research. Um, and I'm going to talk about something today, later 
in the course of my discussion, I'm going to touch on religion. Because I don't want you to think that this is just some Muslims talking. It's just some of the Muslims up there talking. <laughs> you know how they say, the Muslims up there. Are you a Muslim? No, sir. Are you a Muslim? No, sir. Brother, are you a Muslim? I believe in one God, sir, but I'm not. I'm well, are you a Muslim? Are you a Sunni Muslim? No, sir. Nation of Islam? No, sir. They're not Muslims, okay. Are you a Muslim? You a Muslim. <laughs> some Muslims, some non-Muslims. What am I trying to tell you? This movement and this presentation I'm a part of don't really have anything to do with being a part of a specific religion. If you are a Christian and you're listening to me, you are my black Christian brother and you are my black Christian sister. My mama's in the Christian church. My brother uh, is in the Christian church. Members of my family, parts of my family, heavy parts of my family are in the Christian church. They are pastors, they are deacons, they are teachers in the Christian church. We don't believe in no division based on religion. And so they try to again, want to try to paint us as a Muslim extremist group. I'm going to show you today that all religion come out of Africa. All Christianity come out of Africa. All Islam come out of Africa. All Judaism come out of Africa. And so there's no need to be divided because we are the mothers and fathers of all spirituality, all theology. We are the mothers and fathers of it all. So there's no need to be divided. God is the author of peace, as the Bible says, and the devil is the author of confusion. So I don't want nobody getting mad at me or tripping about religion because we will break all of that down today and show you what it really means. The African-American income today, we're talking about medium, median household income, $33,460, median average household income for what they call African-Americans. But for all races in America, $50,000 medium or average household income. $17,000 a year behind, and neither one of them figures is really going to sustain you. Is that right? Is $33,000 a year going to sustain a household in this time of inflation and economy? Is $50,000. Hmm? How many of you, what, what, how, much, how, much, how much money do you want to earn a year, sir? Straight up. <laughs> how much? Give me a figure. Tell me what's on your mind. Hmm? I say about. Or do you think you can? Or you might say, I want two billion a year. But how much do you believe your earning capacity is? About 75,000. 75,000. How about you, Queen? 75,000. You, God? I'm not going to put a cap on it. You ain't going to put a cap on it. That's right. Go ahead. That's right. I'm mean, just saying, what do you expect? Though? Let's try to, what do you expect to earn upon graduation? What would you like to earn in your initial years of your career? That's the 75,000. 75,000 to get going. Andres? I don't know, because I don't want to work there for many years, because I don't expect to get there either. Then I'm going to change your mind. What's your major? My major is arts. Your major is arts. You're a freshman, right? So you got some time. You might switch two or three majors in the next semester or so. But okay, but the, you're the kind of person, if you say you don't want to work in corporate America, then we're going to talk about how you can earn income inside of your own community amongst your own people, amongst the hundreds of billions of coming to you, hundreds of billions of dollars. Others, how much you queen here? You, you, we a student, where are you a student? Here, at, at Clark Atlanta. At Clark Atlanta. You were there yesterday, right? All right, back again. How much do you expect to earn, Queen? A week or a year? Uh, a year. A year. Annual income. Five hundred thousand. Five hundred thousand. Sister, say, I love it. No, no low expectations in this room. <laughs> Any others, you young man? It's like Georgia State, but Georgia State. State. Yeah, go ahead, God. Uh, start out two hundred fifty k. He said you want to start off start out. at two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. You, my my dear sister. $100,000 a year. Okay, so all of the students who are here say that 
whatever the median income is, the average income for black people that they expect to earn much more than black people are making and much more than even the median income of white people. That's a good start here because that means you don't have low expectations. Here we got some more facts here. Black man, his income, now you say $633, is that every two weeks? That's a rough. $633, the black, average black man is getting every two weeks, that's employed. Because the employment rate amongst the black man in America is high. The unemployment rate amongst black men in Washington, D.C. is 25%, where I am living, I'm from Los Angeles, but I live in D.C. But the average unemployment rate for black men under the age of 21 is 50% or well, I think it's under the age of 25, it's 50% in Washington, D.C. But according to these facts and figures that have been delivered, $633 every two weeks. That's rough. That's $1,200 a month. That's rough. What well, rent is, uh, or a mortgage, yeah. is that and then some, let alone child care or child support or just living expenses. That's rough. Black woman income, you say is less than that, it's $5.90 every two weeks. What'd you say? Blackdemographics.com. I love it. I, I love the last second research. You know, they, some of these people pull out on me at the last second. They pull out on me, but sister did not pull out on me. So let's give her a black hand. pull out on me because I'm not going to lighten up my stance. We got to, I'm not going to lighten up my stance and change this teaching just so we can get some help. That's another story, but that's for somebody that's watching. <laughs> I'm going to lighten up my, going to hold me hostage on a piece of paper so I can change these teachings. I'll never change these teachings. These are the teachings that are going to get us free, and these are the teachings that are going to get you that side. And that money you deserve. You're not going to, even if you go into white corporate America for a moment, like the spook who sat behind the door, you must go in with confidence. You must go in with confidence and know who you are. You're not going to be able to stand toe to toe with white people and Caucasians who are very arrogant. You're not going to be able to compete with them unless you have a mindset of complete and total confidence. If you're going to do battle in any sphere or field of white corporate America, and so, it gets worse, sisters and brothers, in wages by education. That's why education is important. I'm one of the few black, I guess, leaders in what we call the nationalist community, or teach black consciousness, that advocate education. Did you know that? Many of them would just write the education system off. But until we have something to replace that, until we have universities and colleges and jobs to replace that, I'm going to be an advocate for the black man and woman gaining their education. If any of these brothers and sisters here would like to get their education, or those that are listening, or go back and get their education, that's more important than you being with me. Did you hear that? For you to get your education is more important than you soldiering with me. I'd rather you get your education to help our nation. That's more important. So I'm one of the few black conscious leaders that push hard for education. If you have less than a high school diploma, $426 every two weeks. Is that right? If you have less than a high school diploma, it's about $400 every couple of weeks. High school and no, co and no college, you get $532. <laughs> Boy, that's rough to go through college for um, High school, no college. You get your college degree, you get about $20, dollars uh, $108 more. High school, no college. For black, $532. All races, $626. Some college with an associate degree, $614 average every two weeks, $734 for all races. Notice how all races is always above us with the same qualifications. 
Don't tell me we're living in a post-racial America when every statistical indicator points to the fact that if we have the same degree, the same qualification, the black man or the black woman earns less. That means discrimination and racism is still alive and well. That means the teaching that you have to be twice as good as somebody else is still alive and well. So guess what? Let's get down to being twice as good and twice as better than anybody else. We're not going to be given a break in America. And Mr. Obama has about three years, and you'll be shocked back into reality <laughs> with the white man back in the White House, because the White House is for white folks. <laughs> That's why it's the White House. You say that's silly, as Khalid Muhammad says, it's a white house for white folks. Yeah, okay, <laughs> I'll get back into that. Bachelor's degree, $934 every couple weeks, $1,144 for all races, but $934 for the black man or the black woman. I love these facts. Blackdemographic.com. Bachelor's degree only, 974 for blacks, all races, 1,038. For an advanced degree, average salary, $1,065 every two weeks, $1,351 for all races. And it must be pointed out that these figures, which could seem depressing, these are mainly figures that come about as a result of working in this system and not having the entrepreneurial mindset to go for self and to do for self. These are constricted and constrained figures. What am I saying? This is what the white man going to pay you. But you can make much more money thinking and doing for yourself. I'm going to get into that to show you how much money is inside of the black nation or in the black community. Uh, let me just use the legal system, the legal system, or the legal practice for an example. Uh, I chose to be a solo practitioner, number one, because I wanted to be independent, and there's not going to be any supervisor at some firm, Kaplan and Jones or whatever that's <laughs> I'm going to be reporting into every day. That just wasn't happening. That's not going to happen. I have to be independent because I have to do what is necessary to inspire and to educate our people and to move and mobilize for our people. And, but that turns out better for me in the black community. But inside the black community, there's a battle over legal services. There's a battle with the white attorney and the Jewish attorney over who is going to get the black client. They're in our community like bloodsuckers and vipers sucking the money out of our community, sucking the cash out of our community, the clients out of our community. But in their community, we're nowhere to speak of. In their communities of Georgetown and Tinleytown and the other white areas, they're not even considering hiring the black attorney. So we're getting almost 0% of their business, but they are in on us like a bloodsucker taking upwards of 40 to 50% of the take of the legal proceeds and the legal fees for attorneys in our community. Hello. Uh, am I supposed to accept that or am I going to not only speak out against it and do something about it? And that's why I formed Black Lawyers for Justice. Because we're going to take our share of the black legal business and that means 100%. They taking a hundred percent. We want a hundred percent. Not to mention the fact that we're the better lawyers. Ask John Cochran if you think I'm wrong. And nobody in that courtroom that's arguing these cases as passionately and as effectively as the black attorney. And when we go toe to toe with the government or whoever I'm going against, they be trembling in their seats when it's time for opening arguments and closing arguments and all of that. I'm here to tell you that you are not just striving to be equal, right. that you are a superior and a divine people. Hello. I'm here to tell you I believe in black supremacy. Yes, sir. Straight up. Black power. Black power. Black power. You are a supreme people. Yes, sir. The original people of the planet. And it's almost an insult for up here sitting up here talking about how we're going to maybe be equal or get a job from a grafted man. Hello? 
This is black consciousness one-on-one. -on -one. This is what your professors cannot tell you or will not tell you or don't even know. This is what your professors need to tell you on these college campuses. These are some of the reasons they try to keep me off the college campus. But hey, the college campus is supposed to be an environment of discussion, dialogue, and debate where the arguments can be presented and counted. But there's a conspiracy to keep you deaf, dumb, and blind, and to keep making you a tool, and we can ready to fight out of this. Good to see your brothers here, coming here from the campus. More students have come in. Look, I'm going to get to this PowerPoint, and I'm going to open up. Are y'all all right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, then we tune on in. My subject, young brothers, is the role and the responsibility of the black college student. What is your role? What is your responsibility? What is your future? What is your destiny? Um, again, so I talk about the share of the legal monies. What about human services? Do you know what human services is? Talk to me. Tell me human services. Who knows the definition? Talk to me. Can't even, you don't even know the definition of it. Ma'am? Um, I'll give you my organic definition. Give me your no organic um, vegan definition. <laughs> I would think human services would mean your duty to serve your people. It is. Now let me get some specific and talk some money to you. All right? Human services. There's a population of, disability, of disabled persons in every state and in every city throughout America. What kind of disabilities? <clears throat> mental persons with mental retardation. There are persons with mental, uh, what they call mental illnesses or mental challenges. Yeah. There are juveniles, juvenile del what they call juvenile delinquents or the incarcerated. There are senior citizens. There is an entire multi-billion dollar industry in America called the human services industry. Right in your community where you don't know it. When you drove by the home that they had the, 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 either the group home or the home with the disabled persons or the home with the mentally ill, those are businesses in your community. We are taught to shun that, to shun the group home, to shun the independent living facility to shun, to get away from those with mental retardation. That's for somebody else. Did you know that right inside of the black community, right here in Atlanta, in Washington, D.C., in New York, it's a multi-billion dollar industry serving our people, housing our people, employing our people inside of the black community, and we're not even getting a share out of it because we're ignorant and not conscious that it's right there, and they're not teaching you that in these universities. They're not teaching you that in these business programs and business uh, uh, schools, Howard University School of Business. They're not teaching you that. They're teaching you to go out there and run somewhere else with your resume. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm going to fix your lips. I, I'm here for my interview. Oh, I'm sweating. It's oh, such a big day. <laughs> right in your own community. Right in your own community, the Catholic Church, who's running many of these human service operations, are making billions right. right in our own community. And so uh, I could go further in that. I have a certain level of experience in that, but I'm not going to go into that on camera. <laughs> See, because I don't let the white man or Negro know all my business. But let me, yeah, you can't do that. But let me tell you this, there's some billions of dollars right into your own feet, your own companies, your own corporations, right here serving our people, serving who? Juvenile delinquents that come out and their parents can't take care of them. And they're classified as wards of the state. And they pay daily rates to house, to service, to educate those kids. Those persons that have mental retardation, to house, to serve, to take care of them, to manage their uh, psychiatrists, psychologists, their services, what they call wraparound services. There's some money there for business owners and opportunities and intelligent and progressive-minded people. There's millions and billions there's going on right around you. They don't teach us that. They're teaching us to run out of our community while those billions of dollars are right in our community.
Let's talk about some other industries, that it, some other money that's in the black community that's not being tapped into. Talk to me. Talk to me. Yeah, we are taught changing. to think that black economy is just what? The corner store. Right. Just open up a corner store. I mean, that's fine, funeral and we haven't even done that, but talk to me, mm -hmm. huh? Or funeral homes. Funeral homes. Our you know that's big business. Black entertainers. Black entertainers. That money is going, the majority of the black entertainers' money goes over to the white people. Yeah. You know, this is something, and not, not come cutting your own. Come here, brother Ro. <clears throat> We're going to share together. Thank you. And it's one thing that is so disturbing to me. This is why I am now pursuing to hook up with Brother Malik here. People don't know, such as you, that when you go down to Phillips Arena or the Fox Theater, to buy a concert ticket to see a black artist, Beyonce or Jay-Z, and you put that money through that little glass hole to purchase those tickets. Our black communities never see that money in hand. Why? Because white people are bringing those, our own black entertainers to town, and they have pushed all black promoters who serve as a financial bridge for that black dollar to return to the black community and push them out of business. Now this is something I want you to know that the world do not know and that I'm going to be discussing with Brother Malik. It's awful what I'm getting ready to tell you. Mm. In the 114 year history of the entertainment industry in America, no black person have ever been allowed to engage in a contract with a white entertainer for a concert. They don't allow it. They fight it. They set a president for it and they will not change. I brought a $700 million lawsuit about this very situation. They paid my lawyers, they paid the judge, and they spent millions and millions of dollars to make sure that discriminatory policy stay in place. So I will entertain this. When you take a look at them, this is what I ask people to do all the time. Look at Sammy Davis Jr. He was an entertainer for 60 years, singing and dancing for the other people. But when he died, he died broke. You know why? He was uneducated, number one, and they knew it. They knew he was uneducated, but they have no compassion or sensitivity when it comes to us. That's what I want you to learn. That entertainment, the people that run the entertainment industry have no compassion or sensitivity when it comes to black people. Just take a look. You got Jackie Wilson, he died penniless. Sammy Davis Jr., his wife didn't have nothing when he died after singing and dancing for 60 years. And the list goes on and on. So I just wanted to say that to you, and I'm going to give it back to Brother Ali. Thank you so much. What are we saying? What are we saying? He's saying, he's saying that the entertainment industry is billions upon billions of dollars, and it's not coming back to those that really could be, should be and could be representing us. It's going in the hands of those who have no talent. And they have just gotten in as a middleman to exploit our talent and to keep our talent in a way controlled and managed so that they would really never be able to benefit us and our movements. And if we could get black upcoming entrepreneurs and those who are heavily into the entertainment industry to drive out the William Morris's and to drive out the Caucasian or so-called Jewish talent agencies, and so black talent should be managing black people. Right. What's wrong with that? They Nothing. say that's radical. Yeah. They wouldn't let up. You think they would let black people manage Jewish talent? That's what I say all Do the you time. think they would let black Never. people take and manage and own and control white and Jewish talent? They'll kill them. I'm telling you, black power is the only way. That's right. It ain't the option. It's the only way to go, and it's the mentality that you as a student should develop early on. Now you say you all, you got Mr. Big Mouth, you're talking, you're talking, but you're not gonna succeed with all this black talk. Okay, so let me just get a couple of points. Let me, let me clear something up. Uh, brother, run me down the line to the end. Okay. Run me down the line to the end. Now we can dim the lights some so we can get this good here on camera. Dim the lights, that's fine, yeah, dim the lights. Take me to the vehicle at the end. Okay. Let me get all my stuff, but they got enough of it. Take me down the end. Okay. I, I put this picture up here for one reason only. Just for one reason only. Turn 
the lights down so we can get this on the view stream right. I put this one reason on. This is I put this up here for one reason only because it is taught that the nationalist or the pan-Africanist is doomed and destined to be broke. That the nationalist and pan-Africanist couldn't come on this campus or is not effective on these college campuses because they don't have nothing. Now let me address this point right away. First of all, money have never made black leadership. And black leadership that got you on this college campus and got you on these college campuses sacrificed so that you could make money and many of them went without money. But without them fighting in them streets and fighting this struggle, you wouldn't be at Georgia State and Clark Atlanta University and there will be no place for you anywhere you try to go corporate America or outside of corporate America. And let me tell you how that works out. It was radicals, like the imprisoned political prisoner, Imam Jamil al amin who's known as H. Rap Brown, who was a firebomb thrower in the 1960s. It was radicals, uh, like, well, I want this to be seen. As long as this can be seen on Ustream, for those who are checking Ustream, Okay, so I don't want the lights to be so bright. This is more important to this whole, you can just turn it, turn one of them off, it's just too bright. You turn the front parts down and the back parts up. Can you do that? Turn one more off. Work on that. Work on that to dim this up here and keep it going back there, because I like it better when it's dim up here. I don't mind if I'm in the dark for a minute. Don't mind, as long as this is clear to those who are watching on this webcam. I don't mind. Okay, now let me, before I get into that though, let me, let me tell you something about money and why even, the, even they say money is the root of all evil. I don't say it's the root of all evil, but it can become the root of your evil if you get your mind messed up. Money is not the most important thing in life, but if you have your values and your ethics right, you can make money. But let's go over the history of those that fought for us who maybe didn't have money, but they enabled us to make money. How did they enable to make money, us to make money? H. Rap Brown, or Imam Jamal al amin who was a political prisoner in Florence, Colorado, Supermax Penitentiary right now, who I believe was set up and framed on some charges right here in Atlanta. He is a legend in our community. He shook up America with Kwame Ture, who was known as Stokely Carmichael. And they went around from city to city and town to town, organizing black people for justice, organizing them for their voting rights, organizing for them for their human rights. And when the time came, they lit their matches and cities went up in flames in the 1960s. White America was afraid of the, of the nationalists, afraid of the radicals, afraid of the Black Panther Party. So because they were afraid of the nationalists and the radicals, they cut a deal in America to allow some blacks to succeed. Because as H. Rap Brown said, if they won't come around, then we got to burn it down. And when they killed King, April 4th, 1968, over 100 some odd cities went up in flames and started to burn down. So what did the white man do? He said, come in. I give you a job as a news anchorman. I give you a job in my TV station. Why? Because if a white reporter went into the black community, and if a white reporter was to go in them riots, he wouldn't be coming out. He wouldn't come out and was afraid and scared to go in. So they had to go get a black reporter and go get black anchormen and black news people to now come in because the white man could not go in the black community. America was in trouble. America was under racial strife and racial tension. So they cut deals and allow blacks to get some more jobs and some secondary place in society. They cut some deals so that some of these brothers and sisters here who were working as administrators at Georgia State, working as administrators at Clark, working as administrators at Morehouse, blacks in the middle class were cut a break and given a chance because of brothers and sisters who fought and gave it all for our people. Rap Brown and Stokely Carmichael and even Dr. King and Malcolm X 
and those that struggled for us in the 60s and 70s, Honorable Dr. Conrad, Huey P. Newton, and others, they struggled and paid a price so that you can benefit today. So you got to honor them, and we must honor them. The kind of law I practice is called civil rights law in federal statutes, 1983 and others, 1981. These laws were changed and came about to benefit you, but they came about through struggle. Civil rights law and others that we benefit from today that we can use to sue the police effectively. Though they were on the books before then, they only became effective after the struggle of the 1960s and 70s. All right, now that's one point. But let's talk about today. Because I could be some kind of example to you. You'll say, well, as, as, as this new uh, organizer or new Black Panther man or whatever, you couldn't be successful. But let me tell you this. I, I'm not a broke black nationalist, all right? This is just, I got, whatever, Shady Benz, SL 550, just a car ride into the summertime. They didn't get all my slides out. I got the new S550, S550 with the 22 inches, 2012, <laughs> all of that laid out. But that's not most important to me. Now, B, I got to keep it real with you, man. I like me a nice car right. or some nice cars, straight up. Yeah. Black power to that. Black power. power. Because we are a supreme people. We are supposed to have the best. We built the best, OK? But I'm just telling you this. In the line of work that I do, I'm respected and loved in my community. And therefore, I come up. All right, so I don't have the other photos I was gonna show you, but I'm just telling you, I know y'all college students. Right. You want a ball, you want a roll, is that right? All in the rap music, it's money, 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 balling, 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 huh? Talk to me. Like racks on racks, am I right? Racks on racks on racks, huh? Am I right? right. So the culture is, in, is all in our minds is putting money is most important. Money, money, money. Every time a rapper make a song, it's getting so redundant. Money, money, money on the hook. I mean, get something new at least. But it's money, 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 right? And even though it's distorted, the black man and woman and the black college student does want to make some money. And I'm here to tell you that if you adopt black consciousness as your mentality, that you can make money and plenty of money because the money is in our community. It's hundreds of billions of dollars that others are making out of our community that we could be making in our community. I went to Africa. They said, oh, you and I talk to people around here or out in our community? Let's go to Africa. I'm not going to Africa. <laughs> I'm not going to Africa. But you know what I saw in Africa? White people. When I'm on South African Airways going into Africa, white people doing what? Business. When I'm going into Zimbabwe, Harare, Zimbabwe, you say, oh, I know ain't no white people going in there. You know who's on that plane on South African Airlines? White, white. white people going into Zimbabwe. There are diamonds in Africa, gold in Africa, platinum in Africa, all kinds of business opportunities in Africa. I'm going to say beyond billion into the trillions of dollars in Africa. Where is the black college student, the black professional on Africa? Where is your uh, uh, in road to Africa? You don't know about Africa. So I'm going to share some things with you in <coughs> Africa before we have to sit back 10 years from now and go, oh, well, the Chinese got everything in Africa. The white man even got Africa again. And here we go, bucking for a job. While diamond, gold from our motherland, our homeland, our future. Rest in Africa. Engineers are needed in Africa. Let's go to the top. Take me away from that. I just let you know that balling is not a bad idea. But just remember those that gave their lives so you would have a chance to ball. You see, that's what Rick Ross and Jeezy and uh, Kendrick Lamar and all the boys need to know. There's a reason why you have a chance to ball. Let's go to the next one. Go to the next slide. 
First point we got to make on this webcast and as those who are listening is that the black man and the black woman are the mothers and fathers of civilization. That's right. That you are the original people on the planet and before you there were none and after you there will be no more. You can never adopt an inferiority mentality when you are the father of the white man, the red man, the yellow man, and the brown man. You are the original people on the planet. Not only are you the original people on the planet, and your history stretches back not just 2 million, 3 million years, but really 76 quintillion years. But you are the mothers and fathers of civilization, and you are the mothers and fathers of architecture and science. And you built what the white man calls the wonder of the world, the great pyramids in the Giza Plateau, and still to this day, everybody's wondering how they were built. They would tell you that they're UFOs or that something from outer space uh, or some kind of act action from outer space came and crashed into the earth. <laughs> and that's how another people built the pyramids. They don't even know. And to be honest, nobody really knows still to this day how the original black man and woman, what we call the gods and the goddesses. You hear me sometime in my lingo. I'm talking to this brother, I say, God. That's God here, there. We use that with the small g. But we're really serious. We are the book of Psalms in the 82nd chapter, 82, 6. Ye are all gods, children of the most high God. But in these days, 3,000, 5,000 BC, you were the gods and the goddesses of the universe. The white man was still on his, crawling on his all fours in the caves and hills of Europe. He had no language. He had no mortuary science. He had no civilization. And so while you were ruling civilization and building civilization, the people today who you seek a job from couldn't even speak a decent language and have only been here 6,000 years. If you was to put on a graph 3 million years and to put 6,000 years on a graph compared to 3 million years, 6,000 years wouldn't even count. If you was to put 6,000 years on a graph or a chart and compare it to 76 quintillion years, that 6,000 years wouldn't count. A baby is on our planet, but you are the, you carry the seed, the germ, and the DNA of your fathers. Your fathers were builders. And all we got to do is take the napkin off your eyes and you are the builder today. You built the pyramids in the Giza Plateau, and inside of them, there are wonders that only you, and we were, and, and we headed to Egypt too, was only you have achieved these accomplishments. Let's go to the next one. Matter of fact, the origin of Egyptian or Kemetic civilization is the origin of Greek civilization. Socrates and Plato and Hippocrates and all those ideologies and philosophies that they teach on the college campus, they come from Egypt or Kemet. The big lie is that the Kemet or the Egyptian is not a part of Africa. The white man and white scholarship is so intent on, go to the next one, on robbing you of a knowledge of self, on robbing you of a knowledge of self that they have taken Egypt out of Africa and try to put Egypt in the Middle East. There's no such thing as the Middle East. Go back one time so we can reemphasize this point. There's no such thing as the Middle East. Egypt or Kemet. Kemet means land of the blacks. Can you say Kemet? Kemet. Kemet, and we are the Kemetic people. They are black people. Now, they had 28 dynasties. And at some points, at some parts of the later dynasties, they were invaded by light-skinned or white people called the Hyksos. Or in another point, the Greeks that <coughs> lightened some of the dynasties, i.e. Cleopatra and others. But all of the pharaohs and rulers of Kemet were black people with broad noses and thick lips. Capre, Khufu, and all of them. Those are the pharaohs that presided over the build building of the Great Pyramids. Black people look just like you and just like I do. I don't have the sphinx here, but you never see the sphinx with his nose. They blew the nose off. They blew the lips off the sphinx because the sphinx had the broad nose like you, black man. He had the thick lips like you. 
So when Napoleon and the others came to Egypt, they were so enraged that the people who they called the Kaffir or the nigger had actually built supreme civilization. He lined up his cannons and blew the nose and the mouth off the Sphinx. And today they give it to you and call it the 21 gun salute. Black power? Black power. Now, this is what is not as taught on the college campus, not just the black college campus, on any college campus, but not taught to the black student who may be inside of the white college campus. They don't teach you that you are the mothers and fathers of civilization. Let's go further. Y'all all right with me? Yes, sir. Is this racism? No, sir. Is this hatred? No, no sir. sir. All right, let's dig a little, and we're going to give you a chance to challenge it or question it. This is what's called the lady of justice in the Western or white American court system. When you go to the courthouses, you see it supposed to be the lady of justice with blind. We know it's not true <laughs> that justice is blind, but they say she's blind and she's got the scales of justice. Well, go to the next slide. This is the origin of the Lady Justice of the white Western world, she's called the goddess Mayat. And Mayat means truth, justice, balance, order, righteousness, and reciprocity. And so they take the symbol, back it up, and I come back to Maya. The concept of Maat comes from the very beginning thousands upon thousands of years ago. It is taught in our comedic history and the history of the science of the original people that after the, after the self-creation of the god Ra, after the self-creation of himself, then he brought out of being the goddess Maya, which on an esoteric or metaphysical level means that after the creation of God himself, then he brings forth principles to live by and to root and to establish in the earth. It also means, as a woman, that deep respect must be paid to the wisdom of the woman, and that the principles of the universe are rooted in the black or the African woman. Hello? Truth, justice, balance, order, righteousness, and reciprocity. No, keep it back. Keep, keep back there for a second. We got to stay on this Maya for a minute and talk about this African woman and get away from this and just touch briefly on this Western society which tells us that the woman is secondary, that the woman is inferior, and that the woman is not worthy of paying attention to. But in our teaching, in our African uh, uh, history, it teaches that from the creation of the God that his first act was to bring forth the goddess Maat. And then the others come, Asa, Aset, and others, and as it goes. But she symbolizes truth, justice, righteous, harmony, order, and reciprocity, and it is a way of life. They're not just words, it is a spiritual way of life to live by. And I will show you that Islam, Christianity, Judaism and all religions have their principles rooted in the principles that are taught that come from my That's right. Are you hearing me? Yes, so for all Muslims, well, I am one, Christians, Hebrews, and spiritual faiths, all of it come from Egypt, all of it come from Africa, and all of the principles go back to what was taught under Ma'at. Let's go to the next. Now, this is Asa and Heru, but let's, Aset, pardon me, and Heru, but let's go to the next slide, because I'm going to show you, I'm going to make a point to you. This is what they say is marrying Jesus. And we're going to get off, we're going to settle these religious arguments today, and I'm not going back to them. But somebody arguing with me all night about some Christianity who I've already explained to you, my family and many in the black nation are in the Christian faith. Upwards of 80, 90% of us in the Christian faith. 
That's no problem, but let's get a few facts. First of all, we have been lied to. First of all, we have been taught about a white Mary and a white Jesus, and it has paralyzed and crippled our minds. Jesus, or Yahshua, was not a white man. And he was not born in Europe. He was born in Northeast Africa called Palestine. So-called Israel today, but it's really Palestine, is in Northeast Africa. It is separated by what has been termed by my teacher as a man-made ditch called the Suez Canal. Saudi Arabia is in Africa. Palestine is in Africa. And originally they were black lands until invaded by outsiders, invaded by cave peoples. Jesus is now a white man. He wasn't a white baby, and his mother was not white. But they were painted white by Michelangelo and the boys to, yeah, Michelangelo and the boys, like gangsters, and straight up gangsters, gangsters the religion, took the prophet of the religion, give you back to him as a white man or as a white boy, why? To paralyze and cripple your mind, to believe that the son of God is white and God is white, and to do not challenge the white man. Because the white man is God, and the son of God is white. And this is one of the greatest conspiracies in the name of religion that has ever been carried out throughout time. They don't want our babies to know that Jesus looked like you. They don't want our babies to know that you can read right in the Bible that he had hair like lamb's wool and feet like fine brass burned in an oven. Hmm? Fine brass burned in an oven. Hair like lamb's wool. Look at your hair, right on top of your uh, uh, pretty black hair. And I see you step <laughs> lamb's wool. Lamb's wool. Lamb's wool, I mean. Lamb's wool. Even if you got something else attached to your lamb's wool, at the root of it is still lamb's wool. When that temporary permanent wear off, it's still lamb's wool. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen, Ra. Amen, Ra. Just talk to me, man. You, I'm trying to, this is a wake-up session. We got to teach our babies that Jesus is not a white man. He's an African that's liberating to the Christian. It may not be the most important thing, his color, but it's very important right now. It's very important when you are believing that the police officer, the white officer that's shooting you and beating you down, is from a divine lineage. That the George Bush, and he's from George Bush family, Ronald Reagan family, huh? Margaret Thatcher family. I'm telling you, the white man has engaged, and the white man can come debate this. He has engaged in a mass conspiracy of lies to oppress our people. And the only way we're going to succeed as black college students and black people is if we break the conspiracy of lies and understand who we really are. Now, back that, now this we have talked about, keep it there, that this is a virgin mother and a child born of a virgin. Okay, we won't debate that right now. Let's not debate that. But let's go to the previous slide. Did you know that this is, no, say here, no, come back again. Come back one more time. You say Jesus is the only one ever born of a virgin. He's the only man ever born of a virgin. I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but you're wrong. Back it up. Our sex, long before there was a marriage, in Kemet or Egypt, we know about Aset, who was a virgin mother that gave birth to a child who was called a savior or a hero, known as Heru or Horus, who was born from a virgin after the father was killed and resurrected. She was, he was born, Aset, and Aset, a virgin mother, gave birth to a child born of a virgin, a savior and a hero who grew up and at the age, at a certain age, took on the enemies of his father and redeemed the death of his father. But the first child in the known world born of a virgin was Heru, it's not Jesus. That don't take anything away from Yahshua or Jesus. Take nothing away from him, but you must understand that the concept, that the teaching of a virgin birth was in the world, in the African world, long before it was introduced to us under Christianity. Does that make you mad? 
No. Hmm? Sorry. Hmm? Yeah. Hmm? The original version yeah. the original. story is an African story. The original resurrection story of Esau and his being cut into pieces and then resurrected is an African story. Now, where the hell are y'all going? Hey, excuse me. Excuse me. What are you doing? No, you're going to be right here. You're going to be on this lecture and webcast and walk off this route. Black power? Black power. You got to be a general also. Try to keep them straight. You stay right here. You abandon your post. Take charge of your post. Yes, sir. Do not abandon your post until properly relieved. Now, yeah, he, he knowing this for years. He's nation of Islam and all that. Yes, Whatever they doing, they doing. Let you but handle your business. Yes, all right, you stay right there. Yes, now, next, all of this is inside what they call um, either the peer, the stories and the writings on what's called the hieroglyphics by the Greeks or the Medunetur in Africa is all written on the inside of those pyramids I showed you. Or in, the, or in the valley of the kings, in the tombs of the king of kings, in your native land. You've got to go to Africa. You yes, cannot exist without going to Africa. We just come back from Azania and Zimbabwe. We're headed to where? Senegal, Ghana, Nigeria, yes, and the Gambia. And then we're headed to Egypt and Kemet on fact-finding missions. There's no way you can be truly black conscious unless you go to Africa and experience it for yourself. Yes, Next. I'm coming so we can open up. Okay, so just understand, Mary wasn't white. Talk to the Ethiopians. They tell you straight up, she's an Ethiopian teacher. She's a straight up Ethiopian black woman. That's right. And they teach that Jesus was born in Ethiopia, which could be true based on the geographics and the demographics of that time, and you have to know something about the Kushite Empire, which spread all the way over to Persia and Iraq and all of that. These were black lands. You are the original man everywhere on the planet, the original Arab, the original Asian, original Chinese. Why you go over there and way over in Australia? It's an aborigine. Blue, black, jet black, way over in Australia. Why you go over there, they call it Tasmanian people. Blue, black, jet black, Samoa. Blue, black, jet black. Look at Buddha with the little uh, uh, BBs, the woolly hair on top of his head. Man, this is not a historical lecture on these subjects, but I have to touch it for a moment. I wish I could get deeper into it. Go, go next. I didn't got some rest since yesterday. I'm twice, and I got twice as much energy as I had yesterday, and twice less stress. The Ten Commandments. You say this is what God, the Ten, Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are fine, but understand that there's a root <coughs> and an origin to the Ten Commandments. Hold that down over there. The Ten Commandments, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images that compare to the God. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. All of the Ten Commandments that we learn from the Bible. That's fine. Study your Ten Commandments. Learn your Ten Commandments. But take me to the next frame. Did you know that before the Ten Commandments were in existence, there was a 42, what they call negative confession, or the 42 laws of Ma'at? And the 42 laws of Ma'at is where they got the Ten Commandments from. And they took the Ten Commandments from the 42 laws of my eye. And all of that, which is kind of blurry here, all of those 10 can be found within these 42. And that these are the laws of my eye under the teachings of my eyes that give you the 42 negative confessions of what to do and what not to do in life that they took the Ten Commandments from. The origin of the Bible is in Africa. The origin of the teachings of the Bible is in Africa. And then I'll tell you, Moses was an Egyptian. And Moses was an African. And Moses was a student under Akhenaten and took his, and Mo, and took his teachings elsewhere. But the original Jew in Hebrew, he African as well. So it's black either way you slice it. Hello? 
The original Jew is not Shimon Perez. The original Jew is not Bibi Netanyahu. He is an imposter. The Jew in the so-called Israel today is an imposter. You are the true Jew. You are the true Jew from ancient of time. Let's go to the next one. And I guess they'll say that's anti-Semitic, but hell, truth is truth. It's true. Right. Now, we in Africa, here in Southern Africa, let me run this to you, not long, but strong. <laughs> Got to be strong. Now, this is my brother. I hope he's watching right now. This is Chris Sankara from the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azani. Pan-Africanist Congress of Azani is a revolutionary group that is rooted in the struggle against apartheid. Do you know what apartheid is? Raise your hand. Apartheid is a wicked system of segregation and oppression legalized in South Africa from colonial and invading whites who took our land and then set up a system to oppress and discriminate against our people in their land until they were rose up and fought them and drove them to the negotiating table with the ANC and Nelson Mandela. But it was the Pan-Africanist Congress and a man who you must study as part of your homework assignment named Robert Mangaliso Sobukwe. Sobukwe, S-O-B-U-K-W-E, who was at the origin of the anti-apartheid movement and who are the nationalists in Azani who rose up in what? Armed struggle mm -hmm. against the apartheid regime and raised up a group of guerrilla fighters that fought the apartheid regime in the bush. Fought them from Mozambique. Fought them from Tanzania. Fought them from Zimbabwe. Fought them from what they call the front line states and were fighting against the apartheid system and killing the apartheid officers right. and their farmers that drove the government to do what? Go to Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. Come on, Mr. Mandela, help us. Because we're about to be driven into the sea. Yes, sir. Live, come on, Mr. Mandela, come on out of jail and cut a deal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. After we murdered the original people here, murdered millions of their parents, cut a deal with us, Mr. Mandela. Let us stay here. Let us control the resources. Let us control the country. Let us have our own separate province and enclave in South Africa. And then we'll let you blacks get your half of the money. We'll let you elites in the ANC get half of the money. So inside, but this group right here are the real revolutionaries in South Africa. Right. These group, this brothers and sisters in the PAC, the Pan-Africanist Congress of Azania, they are the ones you can trust. They are the ones who <coughs> uphold the real ideology that we're talking about today, which is what? Ease we laid to. The land belongs to us. What am I telling you? That there's immense wealth in South Africa, immense wealth in Azania, immense wealth for the black man and woman of the world to trade in, but right now it's under the vice grip of white multinational corporations who take 90% of the wealth out of the country and take it to Europe and France and Switzerland and white people. And really, this the wealth of this nation belongs to us. Right. Right. Go to the next. So we arrived in Azania. We were black and strong and standing tall. We were happy to be home. No feeling like being at home in Africa. No transformative feeling like it. Next one. This is a mass rally. And it's not going to take this too long, but this is just a few shots. If you want my entire presentation on Azania and South Africa, you have to go to newblackpanther.com and hear my speech on April 11th from House of the Lord Church in Brooklyn. But this is a few pieces of it. This is a mass rally in Shopville, March 21st, 2013, which commemorates the 53rd anniversary of March 21st, 1960. Tell me about Sharpville, college student. Not you. What's your name, son? Jared. Jared. You probably know. I don't want you to ask me. Because you got that onk on. You got that train. I wish I had the onk up here, too. Brother has an onk that's on his shirt. And I want to show you the comparison between the onk and the Christian cross so you don't get crossed up and get twisted. But that's another subject. 
all throughout Kemet and Egypt, you'll see the gods and the goddesses of the pharaohs in their hand. They have the Ankh, which is called the key to life. You used to listen to X Clan, they used to talk about the key. Sissies. <laughs> but it's the key to life. It's a womb at the top. It's not the cross of death. It's the it's the ark and the womb of life. Another subject for another time. Anyway, Sharpville, talk to me, college student. Sharpville, somebody raise their hand. You took African history, African American history. You took world history. You got to know Sharpville if you took world history. Because the college campuses is a training ground to just be some trained Negroes. Seriously, they can be changed. And we'll talk about a black conscious movement and bringing it and bringing lecturers and life and science to the campus. But it's a training ground. Sharpville, 1960s, is the origin. March 21st, 1960, is the origin of the struggle against apartheid in South Africa. It's where 69 blacks were massacred and murdered in cold blood from age 6 to 60 by the white apartheid police when they had just a mere nonviolent demonstration against the past laws, the white police just mowed them down. I mean, just mowed them down. And so this is the annual commemoration of that day of martyrdom, because after that, the struggle against apartheid took all over a Zion. <clears throat> and the people start rising up nonviolently and violently. And it took them 34 years to get that sham independence. But Sharpville is big, and I was invited to be a keynote speaker at Sharpville from the work we've done in America. I'm telling you, this new Black Panther work, this black nationalist work, got me all the way to Africa. Go to the next slide. And got me honored in Africa. These are the graves of those that died in Sharpville. It's a big day. The same struggle that we fight here, they fought there. The same pattern. Uh, uh, um, uh, deaths and massacres and rising up as we were rising up in the 60s, they were rising up over there. A lot of parallels between the two struggles. But this is March 21st, 2013, at the Sharpville grave site with our Pan Africanist Congress brothers and sisters. It was a sacred ceremony, a special ceremony, and it brought us into Africa and put us in the right mindset to know that we were in a land where brothers and sisters have been martyred and they also have stood up and fought this system. Let's go next. It's one of my keynote speakers at Sharpville. I mean, thousands of brothers and sisters was pouring into the various memorials and sites, and this was one of the speeches I gave at Sharpville, and they <coughs> welcomed their brothers and sisters from America with open arms. Next. I think this is out of order, but this is the same problem I'm talking about. <coughs> this white girl and this white boy. That's on the church walls of 70% of black churches in America. There are many progressive pastors, the good shepherds, who have the right image of the, of the black Yeshua, the black Jesus, the black Mary. And even the Pope himself has the black Madonna and worship the black Madonna, a black Jesus and a black Mary, and have the black Madonna hidden inside of Rome, but only Uncle Tom is out here with the white Jesus and the white Mary. And it has crippled our minds. That's just what they did in Azania and South Africa. Everything good, white, everything bad, black. And it has contributed to all of them statistical indicators I quoted earlier. Next. Back in Azania, South, and they got the same problem over there too in Africa. Don't get it wrong. They got a white Jesus problem over there in many areas. Over there in Ghana, billboards with a white Jesus. Even in Ghana, they over there trying to bleaching cream is at an all time high. Hmm? I was with a Nigerian sister the other day, and she was um oh she was hiding from the sun. I don't want to be in the sun. I don't want to be in the sun. The sun is your friend. You ain't got to worry about melanoma <laughs> or skin cancer. I don't want to get any darker. That's a white supremacist teaching. It's still in Africa. 
Just like they run around, so I got the big hat on. I don't want to be in the sun. I don't want to get dark. I don't want to be too dark. Get as black as you can. <laughs> black is what's up. That's what black woman finally changed. That's what she want. Black woman today, she, I like me a chocolate man. Me a black man. Is that what you say, I'm black woman? <laughs> she changed her mind. Now you got to change your mind, black man. Let's go next. This is part of the march. They were marching, man. No better feeling than being amongst thousands marching in the valley, man. I mean, it can only be described by being in it and hearing them sing and chant. They are very joyous people. I mean, they breaking out in songs, revolutionary songs, all the time. Next. We get the front page of the paper, Amazon, with our message and our teaching and our presence because we got business to handle. We weren't there just saying we're happy to be home. I mean, we're happy to be home, but we got business to handle in Africa. Right. And that business is helping the original people of the land capture their land back. And we're building a worldwide Pan-African movement. That's what I said, a worldwide Pan-African movement for the liberation of Africa. We ain't just fighting for a few jobs or a piece of the American economy. Right. We're fighting for the full control of Africa and the liberation of African people in the 144 countries where we are all over the 196,940,000 square miles of the planet. Did you know if Africa was free and liberated in control of its resources, we would make Israel look like nothing. America and China look like nothing. Now that is part of my vision and dream and others that got some sense saying that the liberation of Africa is our goal. I don't care what you're doing and what your profession is. Adopt that ideology. Yes, Pan-Africanism. Yes, the unity and the liberation of our people with a focus on the complete liberation of Africa and an economic system that is under the laws of my eyes. It ain't capitalism and it ain't socialism. It's economic myotism. A balanced economy that's in favor of African people. Yes, right, I said it. And we got to come up with new terminology so we ain't trapped between what? A capitalist cracker and a socialist cracker. We need an economic system of my art that is balanced and gives balance to creativity, but it's also rooted in sharing each according to his own need. We hit the front pages there and had a major impact all over the nation. Next. Soweto. Yes, but parts of Soweto. Yes, called Clip Town Soweto. Yes, but let me say this before I talk about the poverty in Soweto. Yes, Soweto, you know about from what? What do you know about that from? Talk to me, college student. Not you, scientist. I know you know, brother, who I met last night. Can't call your name. But we gotta know these dates, man. Like we know July 4th. 1776, <laughs> President's Day is coming. <laughs> Are you treating me like this is really like Bugs Bunny learning? Yes, sir. June 16th, 1976 is a day every black man and woman should know. June 16th, 1976 is the day of the Soweto Uprising, when the youth grows up in South Africa against what? The miseducation system of the apartheid government which controlled the school system and miseducated our people. And so June 16th, 1976, inspired by Stephen Biko, inspired by Uncle Zeph Motufan, mm. caused the people to rise up in Soweto. That's where you know Soweto from, from the Soweto uprising, which was a key uprising that helped topple the apartheid system because they could not govern and control the youth and couldn't control the townships. I'm telling you black youth who are here and those who are listening that you got power to change, that you are the king, and that through opposition, uprising, and rebellion against that which is wrong will greatly help our people. Now, so we still got seven million people. It's seven million people there. It's nice homes in Soweto. Our queen who's under attack right now, Sister Winnie Mandela, under attack from some upper towns, and she's a true freedom fighter, under attack by even her own ex-husband. 
I love me some Winnie Mandela. That's the Mandela I love. It's Winnie Mandela. Hello. She lived in Soweto. You can go to Soweto and see Land Rovers, BMWs, nice detached single family homes that we relaxed in in Soweto. But also, part of Soweto is Clip Town Soweto. And it's very poor in Clip Town. Dirt roads here. No running water and sewage system here. Right. Porta Johns you see here. Standing <laughs> water, which can be dangerous in many parts here. Houses made out of tin here in Soweto. I'm here to tell you, you stop whining, black man and woman. I saw some poverty in certain parts, certain parts, because they want to make it seem like all Africa poor. You're dead wrong. But there are some parts of Africa that will make you thank God for your local projects. So while the black man and black woman are complaining, and the Bible says we robbed and spoiled, robbed of a knowledge of self and spoiled from the Section 8 and the welfare that come from the rich man, white man table, as is written of Lazarus in the scripture. You go to Africa and see how some of our brothers and sisters are living there, you'll be very thankful and very appreciative yes, of what you have here because you ain't seen real poverty right. in hard times. And that's why our African brothers, when they get out of there and come here, they shoot right to the top in America. That industry I told you about earlier, the human services industry, is dominated by West Africans in areas of the country. They coming in and taking over in business because they come from hard times and believe in hard work and make no excuses for failure. And they look at the black man and woman here and say, what are you waiting on? When they come from hard parts of Africa, I'm telling you that the African is given a chance is going to take the planet. And they're rapidly taking America. And in these different cities, they are taking over business. Senegalese running New York. West Africans and our African brothers and sisters is making that money in America, in the black community, while a black African American is trying to get a job with somebody else. Mm -hmm. They making that money in our community. Clip Town, Sweden. Now, we adopted an orphanage here. I'll give out a number later. We adopted an orphanage and send monthly contributions there to Cliptown, Soweto, and the new Black Panther Party has begun in, in Soweto. Next. This ain't going to last long. There it is. Can you survive there? Yes, Can sir. you survive in Cliptown? Yes, sir. Can you live in a house where when it rained, that water coming right on your head? I've done it. Yes, Can you survive without a restroom, without electricity? Mm -hmm. Can you survive in the eight neighborhoods like that? That's real poverty and real hard times in a part of Africa called Clip Town Soweto. Next. These are some of our family in the Pan-Africanist Congress after an event, a Pan-African International Forum in Soweto. These are legendary brothers and sisters. Some of them fought against the apartheid government, have been tortured in prison, and have strong stories to tell. And these are some of the elders I was schooled by in Azani. See, it's one thing to go to, say, West Africa and to be schooled by the elders and the Ashanti elders and others. That's one part. I, I appreciate that. There's another way to go to Africa, and you go to the pyramids, and you get a tour of Egypt, and you do fact-finding and culture. I don't knock it. But in Azani and South Africa, Azani and so-called South Africa and Zimbabwe, the culture's revolution. The tour is revolution. It's meeting and understanding those that have fought against white colonialism and Western imperialism and have been locked up in Robben Island and jailed and tortured and killed and have fought armed struggle in South Africa. And that's the kind of trip we were on and that's the kind of transformation and baptism I went through. I met people that are real revolutionaries, righteous revolutionaries. That's what you meet in Azani. And this is our family there. Let's go next. This is Harare, Zimbabwe. There's a Merce I think that's a Mercedes Benz right there. I mean, they tell you that everybody's riding around on the back of a cheetah or an elephant in Africa. Yes, and that there's nothing modern. And we were at shopping malls in Johannesburg, big buildings as high as that, tall as the sky could see. 
Africa has vast potential. Fastest growing economies in 2012 was what? Ghana, Ethiopia. The money is in Africa. <coughs> the money is in Zimbabwe. I'm going go next as I conclude. This is just a short version. Go to newblackpanther.com for the full version of my Africa trip and the intricate details. My subject here is the role and responsibility of the black college student, but I gotta tell you about Africa because Africa is where you have to go. And in 2014, June, we are with our friends there and a hundred other black organizations are sponsoring what? A worldwide convention on Pan-Africanism in South Africa. And I want y'all to go. And I want y'all to be a part of what we experienced. Here I am meeting with some officials in Zimbabwe, which is under attack from US sanctions. United States sanctions have attacked the president of Zimbabwe, Mr. Robert Mugabe, his excellency, who I support. Why are they under US sanctions? And why am I in a country that is under US sanctions? meeting some people that own U.S. saints because the white man cannot tell us where to go. Jeez, you took us from Africa involuntarily. I didn't ask to come here. You can't tell me where to go. That's right. I go back to Africa anytime I want to and go where I go in Africa, when I want to, and how I want to, and will establish dual citizenship where I want to. And will challenge it to the highest courts in the land if I got to and if you got to. We were hosted by members of Mr. Mugabe's highest levels in his government. And at the highest levels of government meetings there, about what? Why? Because Robert Mugabe has the only Pan-African government in power. Yes, sir. He's the only one in power with a Pan-African government because they killed our other Pan-African leader. Who they killed? Talk to me. Who they killed recently? Kill it all the time. Who they kill recently? Gaddafi. Go to the gold And though he's not a blue black African, his policies were more African than 90% of these other so called African leaders who are living in, and their kids live in Europe and they suck the blood of the resources and the money out of the African nations and send it to Europe. But not Mr. Mugabe and his representatives. Yes, sir. In the ZANU PF party. Their policy is what, as I conclude? Indigenization. Yes, Indigenization, meaning that the land belongs to the indigenous or original people, mm -hmm. and the diamonds and the gold and the platinum that's in the ground should be in the hands of the people and African companies and not British companies. That's right. You don't own nothing in Britain. Mm -hmm. We don't own nothing in England. How the hell are they owning Africa? This ain't radicalism, this is common sense. This is called fairness that has been described by the enemy as radicalism. Anything that's described as against white rule and white domination is radical. And we got to get away from the terminology that is killing us and killing our minds. So what am I saying that I'm back in here in America to say? I'm telling you we need engineers that are in college and you college graduates and graduate students that are engineering to think about Africa and come with me to Africa because they got building and the Chinese are all in Africa making millions and billions, billions building and the black engineer need to be in Africa. That's right. Hmm? I'm getting my law license in Africa because there are court cases to be fought, political prisoners in Africa and legal battles to be fought in Africa. <coughs> And I'm not telling you to become no capitalist, but I'm telling you that there's some money to be made and shared with and some investments in Africa. There are diamond mines and gold mines in Zimbabwe that they're looking for black people that are conscious and dedicated and committed to that nation to share in. I'm working on a diamond mine in Zimbabwe. Did you hear what I said? I'm working on a company or a corporation that we can buy shares in as blacks in America invest in our own mines in Africa. I'm trying to get Mugabe reelected in Zimbabwe. And the new Black Panther Party has been established in Zimbabwe. 
and we got a relationship in Zimbabwe to preserve the Pan-African government in Zimbabwe because we ain't got no other Pan-African government. Mm -hmm. And we cannot let no Uncle Toms, who are backed by England and America, take over the government in Zimbabwe. We got to establish a front line and a beachhead in Zimbabwe. And that's what I'm working on right now, no matter who likes it or not. As the scriptures say, great is he who is in me and is he who is in the world. Right, we got to right, stand right, on value right. and principles whether our enemy likes it or That's not. Right. That's right. Jeez, brother. And there's a prize at the end of the rainbow. Yes, sir. Oh, there's a prize at the end of the rainbow. Black engineer, black architect, black investment, black banks. I'm talking about black power internationally. Not just the hundreds of billions in America. It's all over the world for us, man. That's our diamond. That's, right. That's our gold. That's, right. That's our platinum. That's, right. That's our strategic minerals. That's it's right. time to take it back from the enemy and these Uncle Toms and put it to work for the people and for people that are sincere and really love Africa. Oh, it's a great time. And as I conclude with you, I'm happy to be part of the great time. Go to the next. Yeah, I've had some serious stuff in Africa that I, like Malcolm over there, but I don't want to get all into it. And that's the final deal to it. I mean, that's nice. I mean, I like a nice car, but that ain't what it's all about. You know? You can cut that off and turn the lights on. I mean, we like all that. Ferrari look nice. I got to admit, man, I like me a Ferrari. I like me a Lamborghini. You know, Bentley look nice, but Whatever. But I'm telling you, that's not what it's really about. But you may be blessed with that too, because Psalms in the 23rd chapter say that if you serve God, he say, the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. Right. He say, making me to lie down in green pastures yes, sir. and leading me beside the still water. That's right. Take a stand, black man and yes, black sir. woman. Yes, sir. Black college student. Take a stand for black consciousness. Take a stand for Africa. Join the Black Consciousness Student Movement that we're building in the new Black Panther Party. Work with me. Help me to build this program. And I'm telling you that what we talk about liberation and freedom is not just talk. It can come into a manifest reality, and you can be a part of that reality. Thank you for listening to me. Hip Hop Inquirer. Magazine. Hip Hop Inquirer Magazine is partially sponsoring this meeting. Hip Hop Inquirer Magazine, which is a good way to open up the question and answer session. I'm trying to get the rappers to stop blinging, blinging. What's what's the big uh, uh, Jewish guy name to sell the diamonds that they all talk Jacob, about? Jacob. Jacob. Yeah. Jacob. 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 I'm trying to get these big slaves right. I'm trying to get these high-paid slaves <clears throat> to stop jocking Jacob and to come to Africa and get your own diamond mine. I'm trying to get the rappers who we got a rapid relationship and some meetings coming up with to understand that you're not supposed to be buying diamonds, you're supposed to be selling them and owning them, not contributing to the one who's stealing them. And that's not rhetoric, it's reality. So I'm gonna, we're going to talk further about getting those in America. Yeah, this is real, man. You got to open up your mind. If, I, I'm, if these rappers will just speak a positive word for Mr. Mugabe as the election coming up in June, if I can just get these rappers to speak a positive word for Mr. Mugabe, you rappers can have your own racks on racks right in Africa. <laughs> racks on racks in Africa, fool. Yes, sir. Man, we got work to do. Yes, sir. Come on with the question. And challenge me if you want to, because I prefer if you would challenge me. Go ahead, young man. Um, I have a question, but it's not, it's not related to like music. Is that, Anything. Is that okay. Any aspect of what I taught on today, sir. Okay, well, um, my name is Cody Williams, and I'm a sophomore here, major in finance. Yes. And um, I don't know if I misheard you, but did you say that you work in law? Yes, I'm an attorney. Okay, so. And a businessman. I guess the question I have is, you know, here at Georgia State, we're often taught um, professionalism, 
which in my opinion is a fancy way of saying assimilation or acting like the white man. Come down here, come here, bro, just so I can get you on tape. <laughs> but I like your question. I want him to see a well-dressed college <laughs> okay. student here. Good morning, young man. All right, my well, brother, well, John is not getting yeah. free. Well, yeah, well, I was saying, um, you know, here at Georgia State, we're often taught uh, professionalism in order to succeed in corporate America, which I was saying, in my opinion, is a fancy way of saying assimilation or um, I guess acting like the white man in order to succeed. And the reason I mentioned finance is not like to get rich, it's because, you know, my family has had a long history of financial problems as well as um, I feel like a lot of minorities also do. And so with the finance degree, I could help, you know, a lot of people who I feel like are having, um, you know, financial troubles or may be ignorant to, you know, I guess good financial practices. And so my question is, what advice do you have for young, you know, black college students majoring or who want to succeed in corporate America, but at the same time don't want to, you know, completely assimilate in order, in order to succeed, I guess? I should. Brother, here. Brother, Brother, my advice to you is keep the mentality that you have. You know where they're trying to lead you. Study everything that they're teaching. As I was taught, take everything out of these finance books that you're trying to teach you and master it, but also embrace this mentality of black consciousness and learn about Africa, because what you learn here will take you much further than what they're teaching you here in finance. They're trying to teach you to assimilate in their system, and what you will learn here, you will make much more money in your own community and possibly in Africa with what you learn from here. Don't be defensive about saying you want to make some money or you're in a fight. We need that. We need financial advisors. We need people to give us financial services. And we and being professional is not owned by white people. Right. We're taught by the most honorable Elijah Muhammad to be courteous, kind, respectful, and professional to all those who are that way with us. I have to go through that too. As revolutionary as I am, I have to go into legal circles. I have to go in the courtroom and, be, and in a professional way understand that I'm at war and I have to operate on the feet on this particular battlefield. And so it's okay, brother, do exactly what you're doing. Just study these teachings and other teachings because you will have a great career and something will come to you, a way that you can manifest your corporate abilities that will go beyond white corporate America. That's all I can tell you, man. And I would like your information because I want you, as you grow and develop in your career, to tie into and team up what we're doing in Africa in terms of finance and in terms of investments. Because you you should come to Africa because you already know what? It's a global economy. It's a global economy. It's not a local economy. It's a global economy. And global economy for us means understanding Africa. All right? So please, I'm going to give you my number and I want to establish a relationship with you. And then maybe we come back in the fall and speak to the masses of the students and build this movement, all right? Thank, Thank you, sir. Let me give out a number. Let me give out a number right now. Um, and so we can establish this dialogue and really, because the Pan-African Convention is going to be dealing with what? It's politics, but it's also what? Culture. But it's also what? Economics. Text 404-424-3560. If you want a relationship with us and me and you're interested in what I'm talking about, text us. 404-424-3560. And then rewind this tape and hear the comments of Sister Nadia in the beginning. So you don't believe that the new Black Panther Party is just an all one way organization and that we're just a militia. We're a very diverse group of brothers and sisters that have a military with us as we practice self defense, but y'all welcome. It's a come as you are movement and we can have a relationship together. It's come as you are. Just come with the right mind and the right mentality. Man, we're looking for people in finance, people in business, and people that have a variety of talents as we build a worldwide Pan-African movement. You know, and, we, and we're dedicated to it and making progress in it. Next question, any nature. 
Tell yeah. me your name, sir. My name is uh, Quentin Calhoun. Go ahead, sit right there. Just drop that question on this webcast. Do y'all have any special packages and trips, and is anyone allowed to go on the, uh, African trips? <laughs> yes, sir. We will have a package deal. We have a black travel agency that we're establishing. And if you will stay in tune with our website, newblackpanther.org, and soon blfjustice.org, Black Lawyers for Justice, but newblackpanther.org. Stay in tune with the website, right? And then the announcement of how you can buy your tickets, how you can select your hotel, and how you can be a part of the 2014 convention. We want you to get your tickets early and get it all locked in early. There'll be special deals. And yes, it's open to the public. Now, you can't be a part of my private delegation unless I give you a security check. I don't know who the hell you are. <laughs> no, no, I don't mean like that. I'm cool with you like that, but you know what I mean? Yeah. But others will be a part of our delegation. If you work with us and we gain a certain trust, there's certain benefits to being part of our delegation. But you're all welcome. Yeah, we're trying to bring, I have a goal for America. I have a goal to bring a thousand out of America to a Zion in June 2014. At least a thousand out of America. And I want you to go to Africa. I want you to experience what I experienced. All right? So again, 404-424-3560 and newblackpanther.org. You come on to Africa, black man, we Africans. We are Africans, all right? All right. I'm telling you, you'll never be the same. Come on, final questions. Yes, sir. Uh, come on. This is like, I got, really got two questions. Uh, one is, are you familiar with Brother um, Sarah Supersetti and the Black Power Cartel? Because if you are, that's one of the uh, first teachers I came in contact with, and that really broke my consciousness through. And my other question would be, uh, when you was at Howard as a freshman, what's some of the books that you read that really, you know what I mean, stuck with you for the, that you would recommend to me as a freshman? Well, those are nice questions. I am, of course, I am familiar with the young warrior scholar, uh, Sarah Sutan Seti. And I think as a base, he has a good heart. Yes, sir. I think he loves our people and he dislikes our enemy. And he's committed to the scholarship of Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark yes, and others. So I have to respect that. Um, and I look forward to sitting down with him soon. Um, I'm not going to go into any things that maybe have been said, whether I agree or disagree. I'm not into that. Right. I feel the man's spirit. Yeah, I know he loves our people and he's fighting in the best way he knows how. Mm -hmm. And I think he could benefit from some dialogue and a relationship with us and the Panther Party. Mm -hmm. I think the brothers and sisters that are with him could benefit in the Black Power Cartel, could benefit from a relationship in the new Black Panther Party. Mm -hmm. I think we need to talk and clear up some misconceptions maybe about religion. Mm -hmm. And I think I can give those young brothers some advice that will even help them to make further progress than the progress they're making. And straight up, I would like him to go to Africa. Yes. And I want the Black Power Cartel to come to Africa with us. You know I want you to come. Yes, sir. Now in college, as a freshman and in other years after that, I started off by reading speeches by Malcolm X. There's a book out called uh, uh, Malcolm X Speaks. I used mm. to read it all That's night. Before I knew college, Honorable College Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan, I just was reading me some Malcolm X. Okay, and then, um, what was it? Eldridge Cleaver, Soul on Ice. Mm, I read say. that. I read Seize the Time. I then I came, then I started to get into the videos of Minister Khalid Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan. Okay. And so, oh, brother, the list goes on and on. It's the um, African Origin of Civilization by Sheikh Anta Dia. It is uh, 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 France Fanon, The Wretched of the Earth. Uh, France Fanon, um, Black skin and white mask. It's a uh, um, great, great. Other books that are not as well known by Dr. Yusef Ben Yakin, yeah. Chancellor Williams, The Destruction of Black Civilization. A lot of books that pertain to Africa. Race First, yes, by uh, edited by Amy Jacquis Garvey on the life and times of the, of, of the philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey, uh, and also Race First. Um, those are, those are some of the fundamental books I read while I was in college. 
and what we need to do. Which what year are you at, Clark? Freshman. Freshman. Fresh time. See, the best, the best way to get a revolutionary is why you're freshman. Because you're fresh into college. You don't have a lot of fears. And the movement comes from freshmen and sophomores before they start getting conservative. So right now, we need black conscious study groups where you sit here and break those books out, have study circles, and video sessions, and all of that. We need a black conscious student movement. And those books that you don't need to be taught and in other ways using the technology we got, yes, sir. brother, you know what you got to do. Yes, sir. You know you got to do this. Many times, I'm coming to you, Queen. And many times, I, I wonder to myself, man, I say, well, where is the next student revolutionary? Where is the next student warrior that will come after me, that will blaze a trail here? I'm looking for other college students that will do this. So brother, those are some books. I have others that I can't call right now, but I will help you directly and personally to help build study circles on the campus and other forms of the Black Conscious Student Movement. Yes, sir. You too also. We can really build this. It's a message to the students. We want to build a black conscious student movement wing of the Panther Party. And we want to call it on campus the black conscious student movement. There again, that's a way of getting around the upper time administrators. Make it plain. We are the black conscious student movement. Get registered on campus, get you a student organization, yes, get you a piece of the student budget. Yes, sir. We'll work with you. Brother, there's no way you can lose. There's no way you can lose. And others in the black conscious movement go on to run the campus. Right. It was a student revolutionary leader at Howard University who formed Black Near Force, Raz Baraka, who was a leader of a student militant organization in my day, who went on to become what? The president of the student body, right. who was right now doing what? Running for mayor of Newark. As one, as one council seat, now he's running for mayor and may be the mayor of Newark. But what he come out of the black conscious organizing ranks mm -hmm. of Howard University. Wow. See what I mean? Yeah. So go ahead. Right. You have my, me and you, we, we, we got the relationship. Uh -huh. And I look forward, I don't mean it in an arrogant sense, but I want to mentor with you yes, and work with you. Yes, when I was on my campus, Dr. Khaled Muhammad was known as a man that gave young people a chance. Yes, sir. Worked with young people and gave them a chance. He changed my life. Yes, I will work to help change. Yours, and little though you've already been changed, I helped change it a little bit more. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right? Yes, sir. My queen. Okay. Um, I have a couple questions. Well, two, but this might be a challenger thing. Okay? Come on. Come here. Come on up here and challenge us. I All think right. this might be challenging. <laughs> we want to be. It's an <laughs> academic environment. We can't just accept what I'm saying on face value. Yes, sir. Right. Okay. So my first, just to make sure I got your information right, you want us to be black conscious and liberate black people to yes. be black conscious, right? Dedicate our lives and our careers to our people okay. and their liberation. I understand that and I'm so for it, but what I don't understand is, is how can we liberate our black people, especially in America and two other places, when we live under the land of the law and the land of the law was created by white people. So no matter how far we go up to the top in America of liberating ourselves and just black conscious, we're always constantly under that law. Unless, this is my other side of thought, unless we do what they did, take our people back to Africa, create our own military, do everything to create this economic power, political, social hierarchy, whatever the case may be. Because if we continue to do that in America, and we're still under their land of law, what are we truly doing? Mm. <laughs> Boy, that's why I love the college campus, <laughs> because they think analytically and work through these problems and questions, and really we, we can become dangerous to this system with this kind of thought, because you've already, in those brief words, described the goals of Pan-Africanism. Now, I will tell you this, under the law and rule of America, there's a lot more, much more that we can accomplish than we have accomplished. Mm -hmm. We can, con I talked about the black economy, taking control and ownership and dedicating our degrees and careers to getting this hundreds of billions that come through our hands every day, 
to serve in our community here, we can do all of that right now under current white law. White man is not stopping us from trading with ourselves, doing business with ourselves, taking control of our entertainers, our human services, our legal services, our financial services. The white man law allows that. That is a, we're, we're about at 10% capacity. We can go to 100%. There's a lot we could do in many areas. But sister, ultimately, you are right that this is a system that ultimately we can't place all of our goals and objectives into. That's why what? That's why we're building a program of Pan-Africanism. That's why I'm working now and others are working to prepare a place for us in Africa where a person of your mindset, when you feel that you have escaped or, or met your ceiling in America, you can come to Africa. And what we're working to what? Establish our own relationships with governments, our own laws, and our own economy outside of the constraints of America. So we're working here to maximize here, but we have a world vision and a world view that you must be a part of. You've got to come to Africa with us. You coming? <laughs> you with that question, you on the hook. Yeah. You've got to come now. You come to Africa, plan to come with us and help us produce this convention. Because a part of the convention is gonna deal with economics and seriously with the futures of our people. So they're begging us. In Zimbabwe, some of them people I showed you, I was in meetings and round tables. They want college students. I hope Brother Gift, the youth ambassador from Zimbabwe is watching. They want college students to come to Zimbabwe and see it for themselves. That's what they told me. They want y'all to take tours. So they're looking for young, educated blacks to come there to see how they, you can get a piece of the emerging economy in Africa. Yeah, sister, so the question is we build as far as we can here, but ultimately the best place is in Africa. All right, now you go, you promise you're going. Don't play with me now. Come to Africa and the other students, you all come to Africa with us and a change of life. Others, all right, I know you had to, black man. Come on, come on down. Yes, sir, yes, sir. 